welcome to downtown Thornton on Halloween Hoopla. Hoopla. I want to also let you know that there's an annex opening reception right next door with Eric Hammer and Aaron Borkowski, both supporters of Five Points for many years. The annex is an exhibition space completely renovated like this one is for artists and um, uh, community groups to uh, rent the gallery at a really reasonable cost and we do not take sales on commission in the annex. So if you're interested, please check our website for that. Uh, a couple more things I wanted to let you know. There is at the Art Center at 855 at University Drive, the former UConn campus, there's an Art Center portfolio review with five colleges on November 2nd, which means if you have a single piece of art, no matter what your age is, you can bring it and get feedback from five different colleges. If you're someone that is interested in submitting a college portfolio, you can get feedback from five different colleges. How's that? Okay. Also, um, I want to let you know about the heist. The heist is our fundraiser. It takes place on November 16th here at Five Points Arts. Some 50 artists have submitted, and I should say donated, works of art that are tally up to $72,000. And there are opportunities for people to buy tickets for $200. And from that time when you come in and want to steal a piece of art, um, you have no idea what the value is. You just get to walk around and pick what you want. The mastermind gets to pick their one piece of art first, according to how, what the price of their ticket is. But it goes already down to $200. Can you imagine what you can walk away with? Okay, so please, talk about Five Points Art Heist. Please support it, and, um, and it is something that continues to keep the lights on the Five Points Gallery. And I should say, the Five Points Gallery has shown, this is starting our 13th year. Okay, artists from 37 states and 14 countries in downtown Toronto. How about that? And I want to give a great shout out to Carl Goulet and the other staff members of Five Points Arts who work so hard, both at the, the Art Center here in downtown, at the Annex and the Launchpad, for all they do to make this successful. In 2012, when we first opened, there, at the end of 2012, there were people who said, okay, they're not going to last six months. We're 13 years and going and growing. Thank you for all your support to make that happen. And now I want to introduce the artists in the West Coast. First of all, I have to say more about the artists. We get so much credit. We have been nominated and voted as the best gallery in Litchfield County, and then the best gallery in Connecticut. And that's because of the artists who've exhibited here. So thank you for all the artists who've exhibited here through the years. You've made a difference. You've raised the bar. And we want to support you as you go on with your careers. So in the West Gallery, this gallery, the recent work is of Susan Finnegan and Zabigno Kurtz. I heard that last name, didn't I? Okay, all right. Zabigno, all right? Okay, Zabigno, he says, I paint because I must. Painting is my life. And I get that. He uh, was uh, uh, Academy of Fine Arts in Krakow, Poland. And he has gone on to receive arts and grants from the New Boston Fund, Individual Artist Fund, uh, Fellowship, Paula Krasner Foundation, and so many more. All these artists that exhibit in Five Points, I'm blown away by their accomplishments. And they are what has made Five Points is so great. And the TDP Gallery is John Frederick Walker, Torn Books, Lost Texts. Experience as both a writer and a minimalist, visual art is showcased in the TDP gallery where books become stunning visual objects. Writing, sculpture, and paint cross-discipline, which is so evident in today's world, and I have to go back again to Susan Finnegan, because I jumped over Susan Finnegan. And what's interesting, what's interesting about Susan's work is she has text in with, you know, the, 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 what is the language of painting? the color and the structure of that. She is also a poet, 
who has exhibited in all of New England, also Kentucky, and across the world. So, thank you, Susan. And then, in the Lower Gallery, Michael Borders, the panorama of Connecticut industry. He has eight five by 10 foot murals, conveying the physical power of Connecticut's industry, the inventions, the land, the people, the machines, the products, the whole system in a single image. And Michael, you've been exhibiting on so many prestigious images through the years, and we're so lucky to have you and all the rest of the artists here in Five Points Gallery. And last, but not least, I don't think this, Hugh O'Donnell, okay? Thank you. has been here and has made his name across the world at teaching all through the world and has done such an amazing job and who are monitoring this talk tonight but before I do that, I need to go to John Frederick Walker. John's books have been both uh, his writer, he was a minimalist artist for many years, and he's brought it together in this exhibition, ex ex exhibition in the TDP Gallery. So for anybody that's confused, the Laura Gallery is now the Torrington Savings Bank's gallery. Thank you, Torrington Savings Bank. The Torrington Downtown Partners, who was sponsored us from the beginning, is where John Frederick Walker is. And this gallery, the West Gallery, needs a name yet. Anybody interested? Okay. And so, I bring you, and I turn this over to Hugh O'Donnell, who will talk with these artists about what their thoughts are and how they make their work and why. So I'm going to try and be as um, brief as I can be but with myself and with my comments uh, because I want to get to the artist and I also want to get to you because I think it would be very interesting if, if I'm sitting in this audience, I always want to ask a question. So I think it's really important that you actually think of some questions to ask the artist. This is like a unique moment to be able to do that. So first of all, I would say, well, well I was very honored to be able to uh, be in this position of, 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 of coming between you and the artists and setting up a, a conversation. Um, and so I'll just give you some thoughts that I had going around the show myself. Um, <clears throat> and so the works really made me think about history painting. And um, history painting is like one of the sort of staple um, standbys of a great world painting going back right back to the Academy of the Tsar and then the French Academy of, of Charles Le Brun, the English Academy with just Sir Joshua Reynolds, and the American Academy with Benjamin West. And the job of the artist was to pretty much do what they were told. Not, not if they could do it in their own voice, but they were told what they needed to paint. They needed to do a rational, geometrically precise analysis of a particular historical moment and bring it into visual um, of power for, for people to be able to read. Uh, and so that really was the sort of the, 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 the main uh, purpose of a lot of uh, painting around the world until around about 1800. I mean, until about 1800, people only painted what they got paid to paint. They were told what to paint. You know, I would go along and I would see an artist and I'd say, paint me like a god. And he would go, right, gotcha, you do it. In. And since then, since the 19th century in particular, Art has become something quite different. And it makes me think more like um, we have, we have like writers like Marcel Proust, who famously, with his wonderful work, The Remembrance of Things Past, he was able to uh, recollect the past without being a slave to depicting history. He could, he could interpret it in his own momentary imagination. You know, and, the, and I think that what that did is it sort of opened up a whole new reality for artists, where the artist was in charge of being able to uh, choose the reality that they wanted to paint, or accept the reality that was coming to them. Like in, so in the case of someone like Savigliu, uh, Savigliu is there waiting for the, for the painting to emerge. He makes himself available to the painting, and the painting comes to him. So we have, but we have a diversity here in terms of the, the way that I would think of these artists as relating to history. In the case of someone like Michael Borders, of course, you, you know, he, he fits more into the sort of traditional history painter than anybody else here because he's taking very specific moments in, in, in history. 
book. Very differently from any painter that I've ever seen take on a history theme. He's taking on all of <coughs> Connecticut industry. And uh, so but with a lens where he sees like four elements of industry with the, with the innovation, the invention, and the production, and the products, and the people that were involved in doing this. Um, and my question to Michael is going to be, you know, what is it that really turns you on to doing this, this huge epic? Yeah. You know, it's going to be, a, that's going to be my question for you. My question for you, Zbigniew, is going to be with the, the kind of painting that you're doing, really, it, it has its roots in abstract expressionism, for me particularly, yes. um, and also the kind of automatism, where one opens oneself up to a kind of, um, it's like a, what I would call a semic writing, where, where it's not about the meaning of the sentence or the semantic of the sentence, it's just about the sheer presence of the language being in front of one and how the, the, the interpreter is now able to read the painting in the way that they want to. And you make that available to us. And so my, 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 my question to you is, when do you know that you've actually finished a painting? You know, what is it that, that, that happens to you when you're in the painting that thinks, enough, no more, stop? And with, in, in the case of Susan Finnegan, um, she, in some ways, like Michael, is, is directly related to specific history on one level, to the, to the work of, of Roger Babson, the famously of Babson College, with his uh, Dogtown uh, walk of great rocks with the, with the truisms of Babson carved into the rocks, things like use your head industry, all the things that will keep you straight and make life worth living. And Susan interrogates this, but not necessarily to clarify what you think those words mean. She's more interested in actually obscuring those words so that you're confronted more with yourself. And she's, I wonder, I'm going to ask her about that, about you know, just how she really sort of mixes up language, the language of text and the language of painting, and how, and how she, you know, works that. And for John, now John is, you know, like he, he's like, he reminds me of the, when James Joyce met um, Samuel Beckett in Paris. Samuel Beckett said, to, James Joyce said to Samuel Beckett, you're trying to get everything out, and I'm trying to get everything in. <laughs> and so you're, you're, you're like on the minimal side, but it's not, that's not quite completely true, because your work is kind of pregnant with a kind of history of activity. Um, but what, what sort of really emerges, I think, and the question to you is going to be, you know, like how, how much of a sense of suppression and, and, and you know, in, in what you do, do you think about the sort of the suppression of literature and the, and the censorship of books and how that's affecting our lives and is that something that comes up with you? So, with those questions in mind, <coughs> let's, let's start with Michael. Tell us what turned you on to doing this great epic. Telling the story of Connecticut and the experience here. Uh, it's, uh, I'm, I'll uh, convey the, uh, the history of Connecticut industry. Thank you. Did anybody hear? <laughs> convey the history of Connecticut industry. Uh, in one shot, to be, to be able to uh, imagine the history of, of industry in Connecticut, making things, uh, and all of the all of the uh, tangential um, aspects of, of, of making, creating, thinking about, um, and and, uh, and applying all those things to people in in in, in one picture. All of these, all of these elements were were uh, existing in, in the same environment: the land, the sky, the the uh, the, the the weather. All of, affected all of these people. All of the people rendered in the painting: the the people, the land, the machinery of manufacture, the products of manufacture, the way that they interfaced with one another, and uh, and. And then how how uh, how it, it was organized, how to organize uh, the the articulation of, of all of that. The, there are eight counties. 
uh, and there are eight compositions. Uh, when combined, they they uh, they are they become one symphonic composition. So so eight separate <coughs> compositions uh, together uh, making <coughs> one 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 composition. A, a I say symphonic because there are so many el elements in a, in, a, in a musical symphony, let's say, and uh, they um, uh, each each of the each of the elements has has its own sort of um, application to the to the to the one theme, and uh, and that's what's going on here. It's uh, people like uh, Frederick Wolcott, Milo Burr, Amos Wilson. Those are those are Litchfield people. Uh, Amos Wilson. Uh, Eli Carey, yeah, Eli Carey, then, then Gail Morton, uh, oh, oh, uh, Frederick, I'm sorry, Frederick Wolcott, uh, Woolen Mill, Torrington, uh, Milo Burr, Dan Builder, Torrington. Milo Burr was, was, was a person who, who uh, dammed a lot of the tributaries to the, to the Naugatuck River. As you know, that the Naugatuck River uh, came to have a lot of mills in, Constructed along along its banks and uh, used the, the the water power that that the Naugatuck River supplied, <coughs> but there were tributaries too, and and Milo Burr dammed some of those tributaries uh, to, to make to make water water wheels move. So so uh, so Milo Burr, then Amos Wilson sawmill um, in Torrington, Eli Perry clockmaker. Uh, they would, they, uh, uh, would, uh, the the the, uh, the the movement the movements in, in his clocks were wooden. Uh, they became brass uh, when uh, when Chauncey Jerome uh, was able to stamp those those uh, wheels and, and gears uh, in brass. They, they enabled people to, to send those clocks overseas. Be, uh, before that, they couldn't do that very well because the, the, the wooden gears would, would expand when when the ships uh, it, when the ships were were, were sailing, <laughs> and they were sailing at, the, at that point. They didn't have uh, uh, power uh, power. Um, they, they, they didn't have motors. They they they. They used sails. Uh, Gail Gordon, uh, Gail Gordon, condensed milk, uh, Torrington, constructed a, a factory, uh, a, a really a, a place where condensed milk could be processed. And he was from New York, really, and and uh, he had he had a lot of different different projects. And a lot of, he was and and condensed milk was only one of them, uh, but but it was it was a, a big was a big uh, and very important. Uh, but Michael, could I quickly interject and just say, what was going through your mind as an artist in terms of how you were going to fuse all of this together? How, were you, how did you think that, that people of such diverse qualities, yeah. what was your, did you have a kind of like a, an overall scheme in your mind where you could see them all fusing together into one blast? Yes. Um, well, 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 since they, they uh, since they were mm, exposed to the same kinds of environment, uh, they, they, they still uh, had to, uh, uh, it, was a, a, it was a matter of creating that, and recreating that environment and then putting them into it. Uh, so so I, 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 I positioned all of the people uh, on, the, on the land uh, and then uh, superimposed what those people created, uh, and and then uh, that is the machinery that they used to create uh, what what they made, uh, and then uh, uh, the uh, and then then the products of manufacture uh, be, be behind all of that. So uh, the people are, are positioned chronologically. Uh, the, the machinery of uh, the the, uh, uh, 
uh, the uh, uh, machinery manufacturer was, was uh, positioned chronologically as well, from the earliest to the, to the, uh, to the latest. And, and, uh, and of course, the same thing uh, with the uh, products manufacturers. This so, is, you know, to me, when I look at the painting out there, I see what, it's almost apocalyptic. You've got everybody on the ground, and you've got this great heavenly event going on above them. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, uh, all of all of the all of the uh, elements are those are the realized dreams of, of the people rendered. The realized dreams. Uh, most of the people that you see there. Position chronologically uh, didn't didn't know about any any of this any of this stuff. They they had uh, they had their own in, individual um, ideas about things. Right. Um, and so what we're seeing is the collective uh, the, the the product of, of, of it, the. It's like the hymn to the common to common man, you know, like Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. Yeah. You know? Right. But, but, but what we should, it would be interesting to go to Susan, you know, who is also dealing with the specificity of history. Okay. And to just to get the continuity before, because we, there's so much here, and we can't do it justice right here, right at this moment, but I'd love to connect you to Susan, and ask Susan this, the question of, how do you approach the history of the work, the content of the work, in terms of its literal text, uh, and it, what you bring to it through your, your associating with painting, and, and the presence of painting? Well, I think it's interesting that one of the paintings uses the word industry, and um, but in a very different way than I think you were addressing. Uh, it is, these words are uh, taken from Roger Babson, who hired uh, out of work Scandinavian stone cutters uh, to uh, cut these words that he saw as being Yankee American values at the time. And there's a place in Gloucester, North Gloucester, called Dogtown, where these big boulders are, as you explained. And as uh, Jim and I were walking around Dogtown and finding these big boulders, I started to really think about Roger Batson and why he chose these words and what the meaning of these words had for him and what they may mean to me or may not mean to me any longer. And so it started to uh, address the meanings and maybe the lost meanings of these words like truth and courage. And in our particular climate these days, it seems especially true that meaning has been lost. And so the history of Roger Babson choosing these words uh, really started to make me think about languages and how different times and different contexts and uh, <coughs> text or words have different meanings for people. And then the language of <coughs> these words, the text, and the language of painting, and was it possible to use the language of painting to get at the fact that meanings can be obscured? And so the idea was you know, to, to use the language of mark making and color and space and light, and to kind of, in the process, choose what's revealed, what's obscured, and um, maybe point to the fact that we have to give language room to mean and to um, move from maybe a static way of thinking about meaning to a more dynamic way of thinking about meaning. So, so you're thinking maybe you're, when, because they remind me of truisms, you know, and I think uh, someone like um, Jenny Holzer, for example, who is famously involved in creating truisms, which have become something that people unconsciously live by, but have become cliches, 
right. in, in that they don't really think very hard about what it is that they believe. Right, you know? and that's the static aspect of it. Right. And, and the interesting dichotomy between what you're doing and abstract expressionism, for example, there, there, there's an argument going on there, because if on, on one hand, you've got the reverie of the painting, which wants to just take you away and bring you in and bring you back to your own senses, to your presence right now, without any meaning, just the sheer aliveness and presence of being here. And then you've got the text sort of like sneaking in the background saying, come back, come back, come back, come back. So you, you see, you've got a, like a love-hate relationship with the kind of being brought back to earth and, 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 and wanting to stay in the, in the world of paint. Is there a... Right, and, that, and, that, and actually that very um, aptly describes the process because you've got the graphic nature of the text and the geometry of it, the hard edges of it, mm -hmm. and that's not the way I paint. And so it ends up being something I think I push against with um, the way I work and my palette choice and, my, and the gestures and arriving at what I feel like is um, a wholeness or, or some kind of completion where there is something going on between that graphic nature of the text and the, the abstract. Nature. You know, it reminds me of um, William Butler Yeats. That you described this sort of the annoying mind that won't shut up, you know, while you're just trying to live. You know, and the mind wants to say, hello, 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 what about me, what about me? Think yeah. about this, think about that. Yeah. And he talked about it as like a battered kettle that you're dragging on a string behind you and it's clattering along as you go along and you're just trying to live your life. Uh, you know? it's, it's kind of um, interesting because uh, I quote in my artist statement of this essay by William Eggington, who um, talked about Heisenberg, who's a physicist, and this is in, I think, 1944, and Borges, an Argentinian poet, and didn't know each other, very far away from each other geographically, and they were both coming to the conclusion that um, without going into too much, too much detail, that there needed to be space, a kind of slippage room for um, language in order to allow it to be a lot. And when it doesn't have that, or when people claim that um, a truism as theirs, mm -hmm. and theirs alone, loses all its um, possibility for meaning. Well, I, well it's like William de Kooning said the, only, the truth for him was like he was a slipping glimpser. Yeah. It, it, you know, his yeah. was just like, a, and it, it was catching and then it was gone. And that's just how it was, too bad. It, yeah. You know, yeah. Learned to love it. You know? Yeah, yeah. So John, uh, this would, this, it would be good to bring you in at this point because it's, it's really interesting this thing about you know making a kind of a kind of collected tome of history, bringing together a kind of a document of history. Um, but so, what, what do you think is the sort of dichotomy going on with you between the idea of a, a book of paintings and a painted book? Well, I think that uh, uh, I should back up a little bit to explain that by mentioning how these books came, came about. I was a, a minimalist artist and a you know, day job as an author. And I often came back from trips and had uh, oh, journals and notebooks, et cetera, and I would tear out pages, okay? And they went and became part of what I was going to write about, et cetera, it went in my files. But I was very reluctant to throw the uh, object out that had once had ideas, sketches, all kinds of things going on, and nobody was looking. So um, I started using them as sort of armatures for drawings, that kind of thing, and uh, the compulsive drawing I had done since childhood. And um, I gave them titles like, you know, uh, Lost Booklet or, you know, Lost Ideas. And they, they were, um, that was what I worked with for some time. And I began to see that actually, uh, using this idea of an open book 
not not a book form that you would uh, flip through the pages and it's something you hold. It's something you look at, something you read on the wall, like a painting when you look at it. And um, you know, there's sometimes little bits of type that show through and sometimes not. But then the pages were ripped and torn and the book was battered. And it, uh, it made me wonder about, well, what was in that book originally, you see? In other words, if, if you didn't, I mean, I happen to know that maybe a particular book I picked up at the library sale, it was a 1943 League of Women Voters Code book, but it didn't matter because by the time I was through with it, you didn't know what it was. And I've, I've forgotten actually what the underlying real book was. That's not the point. Um, it was to create something that when you look at it, you say, I get it, or maybe I don't get it. Maybe I have to look at it some more. In other words, it makes you draw it in. And so I have discovered recently, as people have pointed out to me, this seems to be a metaphor for the burning, banning of books and that kind of thing. And I said, well, you know, it wasn't the idea, but there's multi-layers, if I'm successful in some of these books, that suggest that kind of thing. Right. Yeah, and, and I think that what comes through in your work very strongly is that the books are still cooking. Yes. You know, it's not exactly. cooked. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And, and the, the, but the, the great thing about that from, from talking as a painter, I think this applies to every one of you, is that um, it really, when you own the work, when, the work, when your work goes into its, into its resting place or its, its place where it will live on, it's going to be regenerated in everybody who looks at it. You know, it's like you, you, you just if you go now and then the painting does the work and it keeps cooking. It keeps cooking and you don't know how it's gonna how it's gonna finally turn out. It just keeps on cooking. And that really brings us to you, Zabigu, because you know, you, you, this whole sense of the painting having presence, which just brings you back to your senses, brings you back to your body, brings you back to touch, brings you back to uh, like the paintings and your paintings are like a, remind me of a kind of a massage. Well, while you're looking at the painting, you are not moved by any story, but you're touched by the painting, in that you see every movement that goes on the painting as a history of your touching the painting. And it's like a, your paintings are like a massage that's sort of like, a, it's like massaging the genie out of the bottle. You know, so that, that question of, you know, how do you, how, how do you, how do you know when the genie has emerged, you know, when you've given birth to the painting, as opposed to the process going on and on? Well, it's, the, it's a part of mystery. It's a, it's a part of mystery how this happened. Uh, I never was focused to thinking about uh, what painting is, what painting is it. Uh, and I think it's, uh, it's, it's the physical process and spiritual process in painting. Uh, I, don't, I don't try to represent the any at the easy in my painting. Uh, uh, I, the best influence is uh, uh, pure nature. I love, I love uh, drawing very much. That was the beginning of my, uh, uh, when I kind of dream of being a painter as a, as a young boy. And <clears throat> so that journey bring me to different stages in painting. I think it's important to experience. Uh, it, it's, it's a hard work as focus. It's, uh, it's, it, it's like, uh, to me, I love jazz, I love music and opera. And to me, it's uh, the element of collection how they make uh, fine art, the painting relate to music is is very uh, kind of very tight. It almost almost 
the same thing in the just different form of creation. And <clears throat> so uh, it's, it's uh, music is to make it sound and harmony of sound <coughs> and enjoy this. I think the painting is the same. It's a visual uh, process. It's, uh, it's, and I never, I never uh, kind of thinking about what I'm going to paint. Because this is not the issue for me. You know, I'm being more interested. I take a risk and, and try to be engaged with my painting. Try to, uh, sometimes I'm, I'm surprised what happened uh, because I never planned anything. So imagine this little kind of large canvas. I have no idea how that would have looked. And, and I started blindly almost, just applying the paint on, on canvas and, and kind of without uh, thinking what's going to happen. And, and uh, sometimes it's just just the beginning of something and then turn to a little bit more focus in the process of <coughs> doing this color and balance between elements and you know relationship and dialogue and whatever and, uh, so it's uh, those elements are very important to me. Sometimes I, uh, I, I think who, who's, who's going to get the credit for this, what I'm doing. Because sometimes when I'm painting, the painting uh, I was, is, it was involved in the process, and then suddenly, I walk away just to see what happened. And I say, oh, it's done. <laughs> it, it's just surprise, without surprise. thinking, yeah. without thinking, without any force, mm -hmm. forcing uh, uh, painting to, I think the painting create itself. Oh. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's just, uh, I'm just tool. I'm just uh, the one who, who just loves to paint. You, you think, you, you're making me think that um, if, I, if I ask God, why did he create all of creation, he would say to me, well, just for the sheer hell of it. <laughs> <laughs> See, because it's like, um, you, you know, we, we all have clever concepts, but we haven't got an idea until the thing finally emerges. You know, you, and I like what you just said. You go to the painting with no idea, but you let you leave with an idea. And there's the idea, but, but you can't put it into words. It's not a verbal thing. It's it's its own presence. You bring a new presence into the world, and I think that you do too. You know, with with the, with the, the great kind of um, script that you you give in yourself. That's not the idea. That's just the script. Yeah. You know, it's a big script, and then you lay yourself into it, and then this thing is revealed, yeah, this yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah. And who, who, who would have thought it would have come out like that? Well, it becomes, it's, uh, it has its own uh, mood yeah. and, 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 uh, and, and its own sort of character, wow. uh, which, which was sort of in the back of my mind to begin with. Um, and you, you, kind of, you, kind of, you kind of imagined it from the beginning. Well, it, it, it came together. Came together after. Uh, but, but Michael, say that. Let, 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 let's see if we can get these guys to, to come up with some questions. Because okay. we, 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 we only have like another 10, 15 minutes. Because okay. so let, 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 they've been experiencing the work. And so please, if you would like to form a question, just put your hand up. Okay, go ahead. So I'm, I'm listening for the uh, universal of what everyone is saying up here. And that is that space, sort of in between that lands in the, uh, the undefinable uh, realm. And um, 
So I was wondering how you all felt, or anyone, uh, about the role of, uh, I'm going to say, telepathy. Something that is undefinable in that middle ground between the observer and what it is that is observed. Uh, not to go too far into quantum physics. <laughs> it sort of reminds me of a Sufi saying, that which transpires behind that which appears. It's like, what's going on in the background here? To make this yeah, that, that middle ground. Is, is that a universal that anyone uh, shares? That you're all, you know, what it is, the actual, it is a, remains the mystery. Somebody used the term mystery. Well, you have you have to be brave enough to uh, start, and I think it's a big recovery to uh, describe that well. Um, you have an idea, and you have that awful blank piece of paper or canvas, which is, you know, you start out very timid, perhaps. Or nobody's looking at you, you do something rather wild, and say, hmm, that's stupid, I'm turning it over. Um, or you, you just keep plugging away, and it transforms as it goes. And at each point, you sort of say, it's not what I had in mind when I started, but maybe there's something to this. And then it, it just goes like that. And, uh, you know, I, I knock things off sometimes quickly and say, hey, that's great. And I uh, keep it. And others, you know, you spend a tremendous amount of time on it. Something is not quite right. So you turn it over and put it on the wall and come back to it in a week or a month or something. And, you know, you say, Ah, all it needs is a blue dot in the corner and it's all set. Or you say, this isn't working at all. And then it becomes something that you paint over and start again. So John, are you saying it's all intuitive? Well, no, you're, you're thinking. And you, you put yourself in the position of someone who would just be looking at it. Um, and if there's one thing that makes it, uh, it worthwhile for an artist to bring works out and let other people look at them, is that they'll find other things in it you never really even thought of. And that is uh, very, very good. I like to think that my more successful pieces are have a certain richness in the sense that people, different people see lots of different things in them. And that's, uh, that, that means that uh, you don't just glance at it and say, get it, and you, you don't need to look at it again. Um, John, you, you, your, your little blue dot in the corner made me think of the little red dot on the wall. It's very nice when you see the little red dot on the wall. <laughs> it, it, it means it's turned on in someone's life. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Any, uh, hands up, any more questions, please? I'm not sure how to ask this, but um, often when I paint, I paint with a little more ideas pop into my head. And then sometimes I know that whatever this idea is belongs to this piece. And then sometimes I know for sure that it's the beginning of another series. So how do you, does this ever happen to all of you? And how do you manage all of So are you, are you saying that uh, you start, on, uh, you start on, on a painting and then suddenly you get lots of, lots of tangential divergences yes. away from it, yes. the other could, yes. could be first of all things, right. and do you ignore them or do you pursue them and, and, and drop the main, the main event? Is that what you're saying? Well, you're working on something and you know you've got something going, mm -hmm. and then you, you know, say, well, what if I try this? I'm always experimenting. Mm -hmm. and I, think you are all doing that in so many different ways. How do you keep track of all the things that you, the, the side ideas that you get? And you, know, you make a scrapbook, you, you note them down, you take some pictures, you do some sketches, but you don't want to, you want to stick with what you're doing. Well, but, but, but to me, each one of these artists uh, um, seems to be working within a scheme. You know, each of them has a, has a scheme that starts to emerge for the painting, and then the painter says, oh, I'm about this, and uh, this is the scheme we need to stay with, you know? It's like, a, it, it, 
Michael was sort of like condensing it all of this information, had to find some kind of schema. Yeah, kind of and you, there, there could be like the diagrams that first begin, but then it starts to form a kind of vision that is the whole scheme of things. And then the discipline is to sort of stay within your own scheme. Well, what I was hearing from Zignu is that he started with no idea at all. Right. And then you see something emerging, and you know, you, you either know or you don't know. You're going to try something out. You're going to see if it works, and if not, you rearrange it or do something else. But sometimes, I'm sure, other ideas, it's kind of like popcorn. Other ideas emerge, and then what do you do? What do you do, Zabi? You, when, when, when you have other ideas popping up, and you're sort of focused on one painting, do you get distracted? <coughs> Or do you just or do you direct them back into the band? <laughs> yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think she was, uh, a lot of what she was, her comments were really sort of directly at, at you. Well, you said you, you start with, with no idea at all. You just start painting. And right. Maybe I think, a few uh, colors I, that you love and I, shapes. I, I think because if you, if you have preconceived idea, it's blocking the, the whole process. Mm -hmm. You take it, you create it in your mind, perfect painting, and, and in the process of painting, you, you copy that, that idea, mm -hmm. which uh, is going away from the painting, from the art form. As an art form, so it's uh, uh, it's, uh, it's it's on your way because uh, you you uh, you losing your visual part of, of your brain. You're not using you're using the intellectual part. So like I'm telling the story, like illustration. So different between painting. And illustration is, is great because uh, great different because illustration is, is you have this idea and execution mm -hmm. and it's, it's more artificial. The painting is more connected to a spiritual uh, part of of you know, you know, uh, <coughs> Richter said that uh, it's uh, anyway. Uh, Sounds like a voyage of discovery. Uh, anyway, it's, yeah. it's uh, and, yeah, and you know, it's that, that, that's. You know, Justin Pollock, for example, he he was working on his painting with uh, with uh, can of paint and uh, throw on on a painting, and and there was there was like a extreme focus in the same time and. To execute, and it was like he was leading by some spiritual feeling, and uh, <clears throat> and he didn't uh, speculate what's going to happen. He even asked his wife, uh, "This is art." He, he had doubt. What he's doing is was so ahead of him. So we don't know if, if what he's doing today is connected to our past. And it's, 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 that's the difference between artificial uh, kind of approach to the painting. Who, to see, to
to, to try to uh, make a painting what you want, what you think you want. And, and painting is, is great kind of like, uh, it's not kind of connect to, to this, uh, because it's totally different uh, quality, different, uh, that's why you call it fine art. And it, it, it's, it's, uh, painting is universal. Painting is not my painting. Uh, <coughs> Your painting now is belong to the whole universe, universe. and then, then you have the senses that quality in the universe. Uh, because you, you ask him why I was uh, in the Hermitage in Russia, uh, and there was a beautiful Rembrandt painting. The because uh, the size of human size, and uh, and that was that was the prodigal son, and uh, I was so focused, and it's like I I start feel sensation in in me, and. There was so attached to me, so connected to me. Uh, it, it, because it's, it's like magic, like I was dizzy almost. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> and uh, so, and what I was left because I had to go. You know, I was standing in a long, long time to absorb this painting and, and then uh, it's uh, and I, when I left